We have two guests in the studio. They definitely are youth, okay? These are people among whom uh, very many Kenyans were actually taken, not very many. A number of Kenyans a couple of years ago were taken to, for some training. Kenyans taken to train in Israel on matters of agriculture and uh, food security. They came back to Kenya. They have been participating in various things, and they'll tell us about that. Our guests are two, Kevin Wawero and Alex Karani James. They'll tell us more about them. Uh, City, mm -hmm. give them the day's proverb. Yes, our proverbs for the whole of this week come from the country of Tanzania. And today's proverb, we said that we, we would be remiss if we didn't, we were talking about proverbs from Tanzania and we didn't have one in the Kiswahili language. Mm. So I will read it in Kiswahili and I'll ask you two gentlemen to tell me what you think it means. Okay? It's not an exam. It's what you think it means. <laughs> not what you think I think it means. Okay? Afungae kibwebwe, sibure, anamchezo. Kevin, go first. Uh, You're allowed to ask questions also. <laughs> <laughs> nice exam. You can ask him to repeat. Mm. Uh, well, good morning, Eric, mm. Lou, and City. Yes. First of all, thank you so much for having me in the studio. This is my first time in the situation room, and I'm really excited, and I hope that you're going to have a good conversation. Mm. Uh, looking at that proverb, probably, what I think, I put it in the context of agriculture, because myself, I'm, a, I'm an agriculturalist, I'm a consultant, and uh, I'll relate it with a Bible verse, the book of the Salonian, the second the Salonian, chapter 3, verse 10, which says, and I'm going to paraphrase it, it says, if you don't eat, don't, if you don't work, don't eat. But it could be having other meaning, but from my basic understanding, <laughs> that I would say. Let he who does not work also not eat. Yes. Mm. Mm. That, that's what it says. Mm. Mm. And you're sure it's the second Thessalonians, same, the same, one that you said. Same verse. He hasn't got it. He said it's paraphrasing. Mm. Mm. Okay. Mm. Alex, what do you think? Uh, thank you so much, Eric, for having me in the show. Today, I think Mugai of caught us uh, <laughs> quite. <laughs> no, we are always used to when you hit us with very nice African uh, proverbs. But now you've taken us to Swahili. I was not very good in Swahili, but I think I have to ask you what is Kibobe? It's a waist belt. It's a long strip of calico uh -huh. that is normally tied around the waist. Uh -huh. Some people tie it around the waist and they want to dance. Uh -huh. Yes. So this definitely tells us that if you tie the belt, you definitely have to go to the show and dance. Yeah, it's women who actually tie this, just so that you understand. Yeah. Yes. So mm. definitely tells us that if you have to uh, tie the kibwebo, you have to go to the show and dance and you have to to be there. Mm. Mm. It's like if so, you see someone in the waistband, mm -hmm. the purpose is that they're going to dance. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. If you see someone wearing that thing, they definitely have planned yeah. to Kulamp dance. Kulampango. Mm. Sibure. Yeah. <laughs> Gentlemen, welcome. Kevin Waveru is an agricultural consultant and digital extension officer at the Rural Advanced Development Association, while Alex Karani James is an agricultural and food security expert and a business development manager at Upseed Consulting Company. Gentlemen, you are among the Kenyans who went to train on agriculture and food security in Israel. Uh, Kevin, tell us about that. So which year was this and how did you end up going to Israel? Uh, well, uh, Eric, I would like to give you a short story about the whole program mm. so that now I can tell you how about I got into Israel. Mm. So basically, the ICAT program was started in 1996 and Kenya signed an MOU in 2016 between uh, the government of Kenya and the Israeli uh, government. And initially the idea was to take students from different universities to go and train in Israel, then come back. So I got an opportunity in 2018, 2019. Back then I hadn't finished my university degree at the University of Nairobi, uh, but I was almost finishing it up. And so I got selected and the selection process there were two processes. Number one, mm -hmm. the selection at the university level. There were candidates who came for the, for interview, and then the university panel from 
a representative from the Faculty of Agriculture, the Dean of Student, University of Nairobi, and other partners. So we come, they did us interviews mm. at the university to just get to know if you have basic understanding of agriculture. Mm. And uh, basically, all the students who came for that interview came from the Faculty of Agriculture. Okay. Right? So that was the first interview. Then I passed. I went to the second interview. The second interview was done by the representative from Israel. One representative from the Moshav and the director of ICAT, which is Arava International Center for Agricultural Training mm. in Israel. So they came at the university, University Towers, the University of Nairobi, did us interview. And then out of the students now who passed the university uh, interview, and they came out for the for the for the ICAT interview. If you pass now, you get to sh shortlisted to go to Israel. Mm. So I got that opportunity in 2018, 2019, 2018, sorry. That's the year I went to Israel. How long were you there? I was there for 11 months. Okay. Was it the same for you, Alex? Uh, it's the same case for me. Mm. I did the same. I was selecting the same criteria. Okay. And we were in the same cohort. And so you ended up in Israel for 11 months. Yeah. Where exactly in Israel were you and what were you uh, studying? Uh, Israel, the training is in the central region of Israel. It's called the Arava region. It's the most uh, agricultural part, I would say, in Israel. And the hottest, actually, mm -hmm. in <laughs> Israel, if I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. what, what, were you, what were you studying? What were you trained on? Uh, the training was basically on uh, three issues. One, very high-tech agricultural production, water, and irrigation. I dwelled much on both classwork, which we used to go to the training center, which is a sort of a college for one day, mm. and the rest of the days you had to do everything in the farm. Okay. By your hands. Right. So you went to Israel before you had completed your studies at the University of Nairobi. Yes. 11 months out, when you come back, mm -hmm. Were you to resume your classes at the university or were you considered to have finished your studies and just coming back to graduate? It was a two criteria. Mm. Uh, all the selected students who went for the training were at a different level. There were some students from the Egerton University who are, were in their third year. So they were to come back and do their fourth year. And there were students also from the University of Nairobi Kenya Water Institute, who had just completed the coursework, they had, they needed to do the training. So, up, upon graduation, they were considered a student who didn't need to come to class again and do the coursework. Mm -hmm. So practically, it was coursework done. We are doing the <coughs> practicals in the fields. Yeah. So, yeah. what did it mean after the training, the initial period of training? What did that actually then prepare you for? To say, okay, right now we've gotten this, and then going into a job, working for what? What then would you say it prepared you for? Or, or not even what would you say? What did it actually then prepare you for? What happened next? Uh, I would like to tell you, Madam, uh, Israel training is intensive. It is in the joke. Mm -hmm. I want to relate the first day I landed in Israel. I think I found it like a magical place. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm taken from a very rural region in um, remote areas of Mount Kenya. And you land in a desert in the month of August. The temperatures are hitting 40. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then the first thing you see is bare land. And the farmer tells you, I want you to produce in this land. And I want to give you, they, they produce in areas called dunams. Dunams is sort of a greenhouse. Mm. And I want to give you a target of production by the end of the year. That shocks you. But then it's a good experience because it prepares you for the future. It's like a military training. You train intensively. So when you're about to meet crisis, you're well prepared. All sort, food security and normal security requires a lot of training and good skills. Is there any part of Israel that is in the desert? Uh, I think the biggest part of Israel is desert. Mm. And... Uh, to pick up on 
the question do asked i think my experience was basically more or less of what alex went through because by the time we were leaving uh, the country the weather were good right and then the first day the, fa the first day sorry you land in T tel aviv at ben gurion international airport and you're just being hit by a heat wave you know <laughs> because there are breeze from the from mediterranean sea and it's very hot mm. and now you drive from north israel to central israel at a place known as arava where now they they do the production of agriculture and i remember when i went there i was really amazed what right what did you find so amazing what i found so amazing about that place is first the community they were living because let me give you an example in israel in the central israel people live in either kibbutz or moshav what are kibbutz and what are moshav kibbutz and moshav those are living communities right like let's say me you alex eric and do we said that we said that we are going to live in a certain community but we will be doing farming elsewhere so we live more or less of like an estate mm. so what i found there but the the place where we farm we share that land we work on that land together mm -hmm. or is it that every person now has his own piece of no land? every person has his own piece okay every person has their own greenhouses <coughs> right but the management of those greenhouses it's done by community okay mm -hmm. right yeah. even the infrastructure level is done by the community mm. so what really amazed me is the kind of infrastructure they've put in the middle of the desert right from the houses to the trees and remember these are desert right the infrastructure they've put and what i realized is like the trees in every household there are trees and every tree has an irrigation drip line connected to it right imagine moving from nairobi going to the most arid part of kenya right and then you find people living in good living conditions in the middle of a desert in the middle of a desert now that's the living condition let's go to the farming level so the second day we go for an orientation in the farms oh man these guys are really doing a good work when you enter in the greenhouse and see the kind of crop they are producing from pepper tomatoes other vegetables you are shocked because you imagine the kind of weather conditions that we have in the country best for production our water is good but these guys they don't have water the temperatures it's ho so hot but they are really producing good food where do they get their water from uh they get their water i would say 50 percent of water used in israel is desalinated water so they get water from either the red sea or the sea of galilee they desalinate this water and pump this water to the households and the farms right if they don't do that they drill boreholes and their boreholes goes up to one kilometers down <laughs> one what one <laughs> kilometer <laughs> Like a place where I used to live, it's a moshav, it's known as Faran. So we went to one of the water projects. Mm. And now the guests were just telling us, this is where we get water. And they told us they drill water to 1.3 kilometers down. And remember, this is saline water. So they have to drill it, pump the water, desalinate it, and then pump it to household use and the farm use. And here we have somebody drilling 60 meters and they're wondering how they worked very hard to drill mm. 60 meters Aye. of water Aye, well, 60 meters. so much work it's yes. so deep yes <laughs> and the funny story i give i remember <laughs> after we went on the weekend you know our culture you know we wash our clothes probably on saturday or sunday or friday mm. and i remember there's a friend of mine we went we we're living in the same household and on saturday was his friend Kenyan or Israeli? <laughs> he's a Kenyan, he's a Kenyan. Mm. But I won't mention his name. No, do not mention his name. <laughs> so on Saturday, it's a, it's a free day, I would say. Mm. It's a Shab Shab Shabbat. They call it Shabbat Shalom. Mm -hmm. It's like a Sabbath. Mm -hmm. So it's just relax, get to wash your clothes, get to do other things. And so my friend just take two buckets 
and goes outside you know to do the cleaning and i remember one of the farm managers passing by he saw him washing clothes outside and pouring the water outside oh, dude, but, dude. this guy almost screamed he said what are you doing hmm. in israel we don't waste water okay. every drop of water is accounted for so what they do you either do the cleaning in the bathroom so that now the water it will be collected and yeah. be recycled mm. and used for farming right <laughs> or they have washing machines right so i think he didn't understand but the idea is no water in israel is wasted not even a drop i think the only water which is wasted is on that we drink right yeah, is that really wasted the, and that's not wasted yeah. Mm. right yeah so when you left the country i mean this is a partnership between kenya and israel there must have been an end goal mm -hmm. um because we talk a lot about kenyans living uh, this country working with in, 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 with israel on how we can develop our food security and all as you were coming back did you get the to understand why exactly the government of kenya had actually invested so much in this program in sending you out there were you to come back and work for government were you to come back and look for employment were you to come back and set up agribusiness what are you to come back and do uh thank you eric for that question from our understanding initially the way this program was being tailored it was being tailored in a way that the kenyan government will be taking students to israel for training for 11 month training mm -hmm. after they finish the training these students were to be absorbed into Why? into institution one the garanakulalu project and secondly the county government but me and you, Eric, know what happened to Galana Kulalo. No, one. we don't know. No. So when you came back, what did you find? <laughs> so when we came back, we tried to talk with the relevant partners. You know, people who are managing Galana Kulalo back then. So we tried to co have a conversation that you guys... Who are those? That's the National Irrigation Authority. The National Irrigation Authority, right? And some represented from the Galana Kulalo. Because remember, like I told you, initially the project was being tailored to absorb the student yep. in the Galana Kulalu project. So we tried having some discussion mm -hmm. that you already finished the training and we want uh, the students to be absorbed in different institutions. But it fell flat on the face. Mm -hmm. So, okay, cool. sorry, go ahead. So students, some of the trainings were forced to go into different ventures. Some started individual farming, Others <coughs> went to different areas. Like me and my friend, we opened an organization known as Rural Advanced Development Agency, you yeah. know, which is a consulting company. Mm -hmm. And Mark you, in the third cohort, which I was in 2018, 2019, 40% of those students, after graduating and meeting frustration from the government, I would say, mm. they choose to go to other countries. And these students were approached by different companies in different parts of the world. And right now we have students in the U.S., some are in Ethiopia, other in Tanzania, doing different activities. So, 40% of your cohort, how many were you in that cohort? We were 171. So, 40% of that, that is all over four, almost 50 of you, 50 of us, are actually outside the country. Outside the country. And they're working now for other governments and for other companies exactly. outside the country. Exactly. Including Tanzania. Including Tanzania. And our CS for Agriculture has actually even gone to Tanzania to benchmark and look at how they're doing their sugar, mm -hmm. how they're doing their maize. <laughs> yeah. And <laughs> let's come back with that story after after this, this break. James, no, Alex Karani James. Yes. This is the worst, is, is the way to... Alex Karani James is an agriculture and food security expert. He's a business development manager at Avid Consulting Company. Kevin Wawero is also a consultant at Rural Advanced Development Association. They're here to tell us about the youth who are taking an old government program to go and study agriculture and food production and food security in Israel. And they've come back and they are trying to make ends meet. What was the plan? What was supposed to happen? This is the Situation Room. The only way to start your day. Conversation continues with uh, Kevin and Alex. We are talking about training Kenyans in Israel, the kind of experience that they've gotten and what they now bring back to the country and how. 
we can make uh, make use of this. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'm, I think it goes without saying that obviously the knowledge that you gain out there is huge. I mean, just from your experience, it's obvious and you ask yourself immediately then where I'm coming from. Why can't such a thing happen when um, the weather conditions are better um, uh, and better in this where that we say that, look, there's it's not desert. Uh, there's water. You see some rain at some point. So then you come back and then you're not able to plug into a system. Why is that? Why is it? And, and who then was responsible, according to your understanding, when you were leaving the country to get this training for 11 months, from what you said, it was that you would come back to Kenya and then you would be able to work. It doesn't, you know, I, I don't know if there were institutions that were earmarked. Um, Galana Kulal was one of them to be able to work for that. Who was the author, or authorizing body? Who was the um, the pinpoint for this ministry mfa uh, ministry agriculture who was it that you come back and say okay guys thank you for the training for 11 months we are here we're ready to work who was that because if we say that 70 percent of those who went out now went and took that think about it like this they went and they trained for 11 months they took that expertise and they took it to another country who was supposed to have been responsible to retain that knowledge here in kenya uh, well, I think you do. From where I sit, <clears throat> I think I'm not in a capacity to speak on behalf of the government. Because remember, like I said, this was a government-to-government -government bilateral agreement, right? But from my own understanding, once we received the training, mm -hmm. we were supposed to be absorbed in different institutions, like oh. I said, okay. right? Mm -hmm. So when we came back and our whatever we learned... We don't have someone to talk to, someone to lobby for us. We were really frustrated. And like you asked, who, who is responsible, right? Mm -hmm. Part of me think that it's a collective responsibility between the Ministry of Agriculture, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and Ministry of Water. Remember, whatever we went to learn in Israel is high-tech agriculture and water use efficiency, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So it's a collective responsibility between the three ministries. Mm. And I think this is a conversation that we should be having because the program is still ongoing. Mm. And later this year, we are going to send more students to Israel, right? Mm -hmm. And we don't want this cycle to be like a vicious cycle. Students go there, come back. They don't get to utilize whatever they learned. Because remember, part of this agreement, mm. their finances included. Right, mm -hmm. that these students are sponsored mm -hmm. to go and study. And you can't tell me the government has put money to go and train students in Israel and once they come back they don't get to utilize that knowledge, that expertise of whatever they learned. Mm. And I think it's upon that now uh, the embassy, the Kenyan embassy in Israel mm. through representation from various diplomatic uh, staff they, they try to kind of negotiate mm. right and change this program right that we can't be having students coming to israel to mm. learn and we are not utilizing them mm. so they're trying to negotiate in a way that yes look we have students here they are learning let have the student being absorbed at least in county government mm. Or national government. Sure. Uh, Alex, are you working now? Are you working now after having come back? Are you currently working? Yeah, I am currently working, mm -hmm. but as a private person, as a private consultant, mm -hmm. I have never worked for the government since I gained the training. Did you try? Try. When, when you came back uh, and said, okay, well, you know, again, here mm -hmm. we are, the mm -hmm. training is over, we're back, we're supposed to have been absorbed. Did you try and uh, not succeed or what happened with that? I tried my best, I didn't succeed. But I was among the lucky students because immediately after I came back, a couple of months, I tried, um, I said, let me try farming as I try also get into government. When it wasn't uh, a good catch for me to get a position, I tried once to do a program in the U.S. Hmm. And I can tell you, among the friends that we tried with, we were all taken to the U.S by multinationals 
for a period of another exchange program for a period of one year mm. and then I came back. Uh, there are those who are fortunate to go to different country and they stay longer. But my idea was what better can I do if I am trained by my government. People are sleeping hungry in the country. Do I feed those who are able to feed themselves or do I find a way of feeding those who are not even in a position to know what to do to produce for the country? So we have government in two levels. Yes. We've got the national government mm -hmm. and we have the county governments, 47 of them. I'm sure they keep advertising for uh, job opportunities and yes. vacancies. Have you applied to any county government in Kenya for a job? Or have you ever seen any advertisement for a job that suits your qualifications? Eric, if I open my email right now, I have applied to more than even 20 positions. Mm -hmm. I was talking to him. There is a project that came in uh, funded by the World Bank, the Agricultural uh, Value Addition Program after mm -hmm. the NAGRIP ended. Mm -hmm. These are programs that we are even trying to negotiate. Please absorb these students to these programs. Mm -hmm. County government, you understand that selection criteria for the program was very fair. Having a channel out around 700 plus now, every county could account to at least five students countrywide who come from specific counties mm. and have undergone through the training. Mm. That tells you we are not short of any kind of uh, uh, skills, but who takes the job. Okay. To the best of your knowledge, has any of the close to 900 students who have benefited from this program, mm. which is still ongoing, you said, right? Has any of them actually ended up working in government? Uh, to the best of your knowledge. To my best of my knowledge, a higher percentage were poached by multinationals, mm. private companies, and to a lower percentage, they are on few county government, but on contract. I have a case example of like, Keep your county. We have a student who is there, and she is working on contract basis. Okay. So, uh, I would say the transitional uptick is five percent to the government, which is very low. Hmm. But a majority are working within Kenya. A majority are working within Kenya. Yes. Okay. At private capacity. Yes. And also under maybe a few companies here and there. Whether pri private or public. They are working towards food security in Kenya. Exactly. Applying the knowledge that they have. Mm -hmm. So can't you say that the government actually has achieved what it wanted to achieve? Students have been trained in Kenya. Remember, mm -hmm. they still, even in the university, there's yeah. a lot, there's money that goes towards training Tra you, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And then they have sent you abroad and then you've come back and you are applying your trade and skills within country. My big question goes here, to what scale? Are you contributing to food security if you take my capacity right now mm. i am contributing yes after the training but can i do more if given an opportunity eric if you take me now to galana Kulalo and tell me now this is the project can we do it i can do more fair than what i am doing currently reason to obvious things financial constraints that is actually one of the major things mm -hmm. let me ask something there's something mm -hmm. you mentioned mm -hmm. high tech mm -hmm. farming mm -hmm. and management of water mm -hmm. talk a little about this when you say high tech agriculture what is what qualifies that being high tech uh, high tech agriculture is basically technology mm. advanced technology in agriculture i'll give you a case example of the farm that i used to to work it's in a Mashafaran, it's a living community. So the greenhouses, the way the greenhouses are set, there are multiple greenhouses. But the way these greenhouses are set, we have computers. In the greenhouse, we have remote sensors, right? What do they do? So the purpose of the remote sensors is to detect, one, temperature in the greenhouses, the uh, irrigation capacity, right, and air in the greenhouses. And I always give this funny example. So one day, 
the form manager called me to his office. He told me, because uh, a, a student, you are given responsibility to operate this technology. Like he'll tell you, go and, and irrigate greenhouse number 14. So just go there, their computers, switch on the computers, and the irrigation happens, starts, yeah. starts right? Mm -hmm. So you don't work with a jelly can of water? <laughs> <laughs> There's no jelly can of water. <laughs> so everything is automated, right? <laughs> so he calls me to his office and asks me, have you irrigated greenhouse number 14? Mm. You know, <laughs> some, I told him, yeah, I have done it. And then he laughs. He, he calls me, Kelvin, this is a data. Greenhouse number 14 from his phone. Mm. He's operating the greenhouse from his phone. He tells me, greenhouse number 14, this is the current water levels. You have not done anything. And then he tells me, go and do it. So what I'm, I'm trying to say is, <laughs> they... You took this bad king and habit. <laughs> I don't know to ask that. So yes. you hadn't done it. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't done it. <laughs> you actually hadn't done it. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I was about to go and do it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Only that I didn't want to tell him that I'm going to do it. <laughs> right? You represented as well. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it is a very, very, very high tech technology. Now this like water it. thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the irrigation is not just automated. Mm -hmm. But it's computerized. Computerized. Okay. Yes. So water management, what is it about this water and how do you manage it? Any of you can answer in, in, in this desert. Mm -hmm. What is it that makes the management of water in this country so unique? Yes, I would say what I learned in school, 90% of Israeli water is recycled. Right? Remember, water is a very, very scarce commodity in that country. So 90% of that water is recycled. So every water that they get, they use it in the household level, right? Cooking, cleaning. So this water is recycled, is treated, and pumped to the greenhouses, right? So you, you, you find that the water use efficiency level is very, very, very high. I always give this example. Right now, in the country, we are expecting heavy rains next month march because normally the heavy rain start from march to may and at this point in time we have drought there's no water in the country right so you'll find out in the next there's no water in the country mm -hmm. but the businesses that require water are still are, ongoing are, are, are still ongoing. ongoing yes none of them has stopped are stopped they don't have cattle dying in large numbers yeah nothing of that sort is happening and there is water in my house this morning when I came, I took a shower, there's water. But there's no water for farming. Right? In most areas. You, you're still in Israel. He's mm. in Kenya now. Oh, no, no, no. I'm with him. No, no, we are both here. Okay, mm. cool. You see, you see where I'm going with this is very simple. Mm. Given your experience in Israel, mm. would you say we have a water problem in Kenya? I wouldn't say that you have a water problem mm. in Kenya. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say that. Yeah. Mm. I wouldn't I say that. Mm. What we have in Kenya is water management problem. Mm. we have plenty of water <laughs> what we are having is water management problems even in the areas where alex maybe you can explain that a little bit more mm. so we can you know yeah open it even in the areas where you look at it on the face of it it's dry there's not a drop of water in mm. sight right yes. people are not able to water their livestock people are not able to irrigate their farms so you know things go up in smoke literally but you're saying there's water enough of it there is yes explain i'll explain it uh, easy sometimes back in trukana we discovered water aquifers and that was the end of it after the discovery after the discovery mm. secondly what happens in israel they have created something called water national water distribution channels if we have water let's say every at least in the boundaries of at least four or three counties, we will always have a water body. What we don't do is we do not have a mechanism to distribute this water mm. to these people. We are having um, a case whereby we can transport water miles and miles from a sea up north to the central region. It's like we have a sea in Nairobi and you need to take water to a place like Meru. And it is possible. So... In Kenya, we have an equal distribution of water. The water that we take in Nairobi 
comes from Dakaini, mm -hmm. Muranga. Mm -hmm. It's possible. So that tells you what? Even in Turkana, even in areas like Mandera, if we create a national water distribution program, it is possible. Another thing we have um, right now, a couple of months, the country, uh, not even weeks, we were really praying for the rains. And I'm, I'm among the people who are also really saying, let's pray for these rains. But we are having a case here of constant inconsistency in this country. Mm. We will pray for the rain, Eric, today. When the rain comes, we start praying for people who are dying out of floods. Mm. Mm -hmm. So what happens? That tells you what? We need a management system whereby we've already predicted we are coming to heavy rains. Can we have water pumps? Can we have water reservoirs that we can harvest this water? Mm. So that we don't continue having a cycle of floods, drought. People dying out of floods and a couple of months we are dying out of hunger. Mm. Now the aquifer you speak of in uh, Turkana, those who actually explored and found it said it had the capacity to supply water to the country for the next 70 years 70 years correct okay correct but the crying shame was that there were people who were even willing to bring desalination mm -hmm. facilities mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. and somehow that didn't seem to be a priority mm -hmm. so when we talk about and i'm glad you mentioned the issue of distribution so it means if you look at some of the areas that we consider to be dry and arid like say Wajir, very low water table. It's not that there's no water. There mm -hmm. is water. Mm -hmm. But somehow the mind set that we seem to have determined to have is that everything we do must be rain fed. Yes. Thank you. And yet rain is just water. Mm -hmm. Instead of the focus on water. Now with your training, how do you get to a point where this training is put to use in the small enclave where you are? Say for instance in the county you come from. Mm -hmm. Have you knocked on those doors and said, folks, they, 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 just simply this, I need an appointment with the Minister for Agriculture. This is what I'm trained to do. Mm. In case you doubt it, why don't I volunteer my services mm. for two months so mm. that you can see what I am able to do. If it makes sense to you, employ me mm -hmm. so that I can do more of it. Ha, ha, have you gone that route yet? Yes. Uh, one of the conversations that we are having is we want to move our agriculture from rain-fed to irrigated. And I can give an example of my county where I come from. The president was there last year to launch the Badam. Right? This is Kirinyaga. This is Kirinyaga. Mm -hmm. Correct. And this dam is going to be used for rice production and other crop production. Right now, in Moya, we only have one crop cycle, crop season per, per year. Only one season per year. And how many can we have? Right now, we can have two. At most two. Mm. So you see, with now opening up the irrigation system, we are going to put more production. And remember, our issue in the country is food production. Yeah. The only way we can solve food insecurity is increased production. Mm. Right? And as we are moving from rain fed agriculture to irrigation, we are also put in another factor weather intelligence. Right? Mm. That we can be able now to predict. This month, at this particular month, this is when the rains are, this is how the temperatures are, this is how the air condition is. I mean, this is the right time for production, mm. right? So with such sort of weather intelligence, we are going to maximize on production. So what you are doing is, we are trying to link that gap between different value actors from weather intelligence company, irrigation companies, pesticide companies, to make sure that all these players are into place, mm. right? Because I can tell you, Eric, if we have weather intelligence, and that's why uh, you started by introducing me as a digital extension services, because we want to bring this technology to farmers. That, look, as a farmer, I can operate. I can have weather data in my phone. I can know how to predict my production, right? So with this sort of information, and we put all this into place, we put something called collective synergies mm -hmm. from different players. Then we can move the conversation forward. What have you done in Kirinyaga? So you you are a consultant. Mm -hmm. um, what is it that you do now on a daily basis? Do, uh, do you advise government? Do you advise farmers? Do you advise the private sector in the agricultural space? Uh, I don't. So far, I don't work with any 
part of government, both national or county, mm. um, working with private sector. Mm. And recently, last year, me and Alex, we had a project in Burundi. Mm. In Burundi. There's a company known as Mutra Company, and they want to do production in the country. So they contracted us to just go and provide the extension services and consultation services. Mm. So basically, what these guys want to do, they don't want to get into production without really knowing what is on the ground. So they called us. We moved to the eight provinces in Burundi, each one of them, mm. interacting with farmers, asking them questions about the rain patterns, you know, the condition, the biodiversity condition in the areas. Mm. And we also took samples, soil samples. Mm. Right? Because we want to, act to assess the whole condition of the areas, mm. you know, do sampling and provide a report to them and tell, hey guys, in a province in central Burundi, this is the best place to grow, let's say maize or pineapples or whichever, right? So coming to your question, Eric, I haven't gotten that opportunity to work with the government. And this is my clarion call because we have so much to offer mm -hmm. to both national government and county government. That they should basically just tap into the knowledge into, yeah. that is already here. Yes. Alex, I, want to say something. Mm. I, I think I want to respond to your question. I got it very right. What initiative have we taken mm. to contact either the government at national level and at county level? Mm. We understand very well each county at the moment they have at least land that is not in use. Mm. In fact, the word is there are plenty mm. of land that is not in use. That is not in use. We have been making a call. Please give us this land. You have young people at county levels. We will build model farm for them. Mm. Call financial institutions. Let them pump. We don't don't give us the money. We have the skills. If you want people to farm at your county level, if there is land that you have, we will we will have enough capacity. Not as individuals, even in uh, I don't have to leave Kirinyaka County or Embu County and go to Kilifi. Mm. We have students who have undergone the same training from Kilifi. Call the student on board, give them the land, and they will produce. But there's also another thing that comes in. In this country, we are saying that we are having a lot of idle land, but how much land is there without conflict? Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of government land that has no conflict. In mm -hmm. fact, we've been talking about uh, how many? 250,000 acres of land is mm. now going into private sector yes. in Galana Kulalu. Mm -hmm. That is a government project. From here, I talk to the Minister for Agriculture. Yes? Yeah. He is handing over the land to private uh, sector. In fact, we'll put you in touch with the PS. Mm. He says he's already receiving applications for this land yes. for Galana Kulalu from the private sector. How about looking at this uh, resource that we have that yeah, was trained? Right. Thank I'll you very much, gentlemen, for joining us today. Alex Karani James and Kevin Wawero are two very patriotic Kenyans who've been trained through the government and the government of Israel. And they are here. They're saying, we are experts on food security. Use us, please. It's